Islam is a poor counterfeit of Christianity and Judaism. It is created intentionally with the sole purpose of destroying these two Abrahamic religions. To establish relevance and as a masterful stroke of convenience, these two Judeo-Christian religions are branded as corrupted and hence they became good for nothing. Islam, as the Muslim scholars falsely claim, has come to correct and abolish these two corrupted and distorted religions. Islam, as they also believe, has come to take people from the false worship of a human being, they mean Jesus Christ, to the true worship of the one God, they reject the Holy Trinity. Islam deceives and blinds Muslims and makes them believe that Christians worship a human being like them, the Lord Jesus Christ, and also worship three gods, God, Mary, and Jesus. Muhammad had never heard about the true Christian doctrine of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He tried to refute a false form of the Trinity, the Father, God, the Mother, Mary, and their Son, Jesus. In this chapter, we will try to answer and refute those false claims of Islam against Christianity. Traditionally, Western missionaries called the religion of Muhammad the Fortress of Islam. The name came out of the fact that there is no man-made religion in the entire world that has ever resisted the gospel of Jesus Christ as Islam does. To illustrate this fact, there was a Western missionary man who lived for over 20 years in Iran preaching the good news of Jesus to the Iranian Muslims. This is a true story which happened before the Iranian Islamic Revolution of 1979. That revolution brought to power Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini who abolished religious tolerance and banned Christianity. After living many years in Tehran, the Western missionary man succeeded in converting one, young, Iranian boy to Christianity resulting in the boy being killed by his family. The Western missionary man took his belongings and returned to Europe. He was not able to spread his teachings because he did not understand the hidden strongholds that kept the Muslims from understanding and accepting the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In order to understand those strongholds or obstacles one needs to read Islam and to know more about its followers. Apart from this fact, there was nothing wrong with either the Western missionary man or the gospel of Jesus. I would like to summarize some of the strongholds that keep the Muslims immunized against the truth of Christianity. To begin with, I would like to argue against the idea that Islam is an interconnected system of beliefs and that if any one of its tenets is proved wrong its whole foundation would collapse. As a matter of fact, there are hundreds of wrong things in Islam that Muslim and non-Muslim scholars have already discovered and pointed them out. Let us begin with Muslim scholars first. Whenever a Muslim scholar discovers something wrong with the Quran or the Hadiths, he will be condemned as a heretic and put to death. If he is lucky enough to escape the death penalty, he will be called Zindiq, heretic, and either be compelled to flee from his home country and seek refugee status in a Western country like the Egyptian scholar Nasir Hamid Abu Zaid, or be forced to recant his teachings or writings as the greatest Egyptian thinker, Taha Hussein, or the recent case of Dr. Syed Mahmoud al Kimni. There are numerous examples in the past of Muslim scholars who came up with new readings or interpretations of Islam to improve the status of women or Muslim social life, but they were condemned as zanatika, heretics, and met with fatal consequences. One classic example was Mansur al Halaj. 858 to 922 AD. He was publicly executed in Baghdad. They cut his arms, legs, tongue, leaving his head for last. They cut him into pieces and then they burned his remains. Lay Muslim people face more drastic reactions compared to scholars and are usually brutally executed as apostates and their bodies were burned. All the so-called four rightly guided caliphs of Muhammad burned the apostates believing that the apostates are not worthy to receive decent burials. If someone is born Muslim, he has to live and die as a Muslim or otherwise he will be put to death. The law of apostasy is the first stronghold that Muhammad created to lock his followers within his religious system. When the church deviated from the truth, during the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, it burned at the stake William Tyndall and John Hus exhumed the bones of John Wycliffe and burned them too. The only difference, the church had no biblical commandment to kill those who disagreed with it, 
but Muslims have direct commandment from their Prophet Muhammad who says, whoever changes his religion, kill him, Sahih al-Bukhari, Hadith No. 3017. The Quran also supports the commandment of Muhammad, and prescribes the death penalty to heretics and apostates, but if they turn back, seize them and kill them wherever you find them. And do not take from them any ally and not any helper, Surah al-Nisa 4, verse 89. There are many more authentic hadiths that prescribe the capital punishment to Muslim apostates. The Prophet Muhammad said, if somebody, a Muslim, discards his religion, kill him, Sahih al-Bukhari, Volume 4, Book 52, Hadith No. 260. He also said, the blood of a Muslim who confesses that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah and that I am his apostle, cannot be shed except in three cases, in Kisas for murder, a married person who commits illegal sexual intercourse and the one who reverts from Islam and leaves the Muslims, Sahih al-Bukhari, Volume 9, Book 83, Hadith No. 17. These are authentic hadiths, and hence no Muslim scholar can deny them and remain still Muslim. In a later chapter we shall give some examples of thousands upon thousands of Muslim apostates who were killed in gruesome and inhumane ways during the wars of apostasy at the time of the first Muslim Caliphate of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and under the leadership of the greatest Muslim militarily commander, Khalid ibn al-Walid. Some apostates were beheaded, some burned, some drowned in wells, and yet others thrown from high places. When ISIS burned the Jordanian pilot Mose Kazisba, they did so because they condemned him as a Muslim apostate and punished him according to the Sharia. The second obstacle has to do with the nature of the Quran. The Quran is believed to be the very words of Allah in which the angel Gabriel, had dictated word for word to Muhammad. Apparently, Muhammad's mind or memory was like a tape recorder that recorded what it heard to be related to his scribes, who in turn, wrote them down as they heard them. The generally accepted belief among Muslims, that the Quran of today is the same as the one at the time of Muhammad. This belief is baseless and not true at all. Scholarly research has proved this doctrine to be incorrect and false. There are ample examples of verses and surahs that have gone missing, some never found again and even some which suffered editing. Nevertheless, any Muslim scholar who doubts this doctrine of the completeness and preservation of the verses of the Quran would be condemned as a heretic or an apostate and executed. Many Muslim scholars believe that the Quran was not created but existing eternally as God. The few Muslim scholars who doubted that assumption and argued that the verses of the Quran were created were understandably condemned as heretics and put to death. The doctrine stated further that the words of the Quran are kept in a heavenly tablet placed at the throne of Allah. This doctrine is a stronghold for Muslims because of the abject difference in the Bible, with its various manuscripts and versions. Simple-minded Muslims can easily reject the Gospel of Jesus Christ because of his unwavering belief that his Quran is inalterable. Muslim Apologists, Sheikh Ahmed Hussein Didat of South Africa, Zakir Naik of India, and the Egyptian-Canadian, Jamal Badai equipped Muslims with ample evidence of various versions of the Bible and that is enough evidence for Muslims to prove that Christians had changed and corrupted the original Gospel of Jesus. Those apologists suppressed the fact that the different versions, translations, of the Bible, KJV, NIV, ESV, NASB, bear the same message and meaning, with the Christians and Jews not seeing them as corruption or change to their holy scriptures. There are 151 different English translations or versions of the Bible. In this regard I would like to point to the fact that what those apologists say has some amount of truth in it. We, Christians need not defend our religion in the same fanatic way as Muslim scholars often do. The New Testament books were inspired by the Holy Spirit and written by the disciples of Jesus. Careful copies of them were made and spread around the world. During the Reformation over 5,000 copies, known as Textus Receptus, were found to agree nearly in all but minor spelling differences. Those copies were translated in English by Erasmus 1516, Tyndall 1525, Geneva 1560, 
and KJV 1611. King James remained the sole English Standard Bible until the 20th century. In 240 AD a cult arose in Alexandria city, Egypt. The followers of that Alexandrian cult rejected the divinity of Christ, the Holy Trinity, and many more basic Christian dogmas. Their leader was known as Origen, 184-254 AD. They made their own version of the Bible making 6,000 changes from the original copies which were in circulation all over the known world. A few copies of that Alexandrian Bible were made and used by the followers of that early Christian cult. From them came the Alexandrianus Codex, Sinaiticus Codex, and Vaticanus Codex which date back to 350 AD and still exist today. In the year 380 AD, Saint Jerome of Jerusalem translated the Alexandrianus Codex Bible in Latin which came to be known as the Latin Vulgate, or Vaticanus. All the 150 modern English versions or translations, except King James Bible, were made out of the Bible of that Alexandrian cult. There are about 36,000 differences between those modern versions and King James Version. Having said this, I strongly believe that the only English translation which preserves and contains the Word of God is the King James Version. Most of the makers of those other translations follow the so-called higher criticism which teaches that the Bible was tampered with. The advocates of this fallacious theory labeled themselves as liberal Christians and follow the school of liberalism which originated in Germany. Someone said if you turn Germany upside down you will see written, it is made in hell. It produced many enemies of God and humanity, Hitler, Kant, Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche, Heidegger among others. Many advocates of the school of higher criticism flatly reject the miracles of the Bible and the divinity of Christ. Some of them do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus and considered it a myth and a hoax. Unfortunately, many Protestant churches began to trim their dogmas and beliefs in order to sail with the modern school of the higher criticism of the Bible. Some Christian scientists accept the theories of evolution and Big Bang and began to reinterpret their Bible to meet the demands of those satanic doctrines. Evolution produced white supremacy, encouraged enslavement and colonization of weaker nations, led Hitler to murder six million Jews, in the extermination camps, Stalin to slaughter twenty million Russians, and Paul Pot to kill half of the population of Cambodia, in the killing fields. Many races were considered mere animals or less evolved apes and therefore killing them no difference from killing flies. The Bible tells us, and God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, Genesis 1, 26-27. God created all peoples, all races and nations male, female, white, black, or colored, equally in his image and in his likeness. We should all praise God because he created us in his image and in his likeness and he made us fearfully and wonderfully, Genesis 1, 26-27 and Psalm 139, 14. Christian apologists should counter the above insubstantial critique of Muslim apologists by pointing out the fact that the Quran is not complete and it was subjected to editing. This should be supplied with evidences from the testimonies of the immediate companions of Muhammad such as his beloved wife, Aisha, his close friend Omar, and many more highly honored early companions. Following are just a few examples from many evidences of verses and surahs that disappeared after the death of Muhammad. The Caliph Omar ibn al-Khattab said God sent Muhammad and sent down the scripture to him part of what he sent down was the passage on stoning, we read it, we were taught it and we heeded it. The Apostle stoned and we stoned them after him. I fear that in time to come men will say that they find no mention of stoning in God's book and thereby go astray in neglecting an ordinance, which God has sent down. Verily stoning in the book of God is a penalty laid on married men and women who commit adultery, Sahih al-Bukhari, Volume 8, Book 82. Nonetheless, the verse of stoning somehow disappeared from the present Quran but Muslims still stone the married adulterer and adulteress. 
It is reported from Ismail ibn Ibrahim from Ayyub from Nafi from ibn Umar who said, Let none of you say I have acquired the whole of the Quran. How does he know what all of it is when much of the Quran has disappeared? Rather let him say, I have acquired what has survived, al suyudi al it fi ulam al-Quran, page 524. Zayr ibn Habaish reported, Ubayi ibn Kabi said to me, what is the extent of Surat al-Azab? I said, 70, or 73 verses. He said, yet it used to be equal to Surat al-Baqarah and in it we recited the verse of stoning. I said, and what is the verse of stoning? He replied, the fornicators among the married men and married women stone them as an exemplary punishment from Allah, and Allah is mighty and wise. Al-Suyudi, al Kinfi ulam al-Quran Page 524 Surah al-Baqarah is 286 verses and Surah al-Azab is 73 verses. So, according to this revered companion of the Prophet Muhammad there are 213 verses went missing from Surah al-Azab. Aisha said that Surah al-Azab used to be recited, in the lifetime of the Prophet, as having 200 verses, but when Uthman collected the Musa halves, all they could find was its present length, Jalal al-Din al-Suyudi, al it Kinfi ulam al-Quran, Part 2, Page 25 In the present Quran, Surah al-Azab is 73 verses only. According to the beloved wife of the Prophet Muhammad, Aisha of whom he said, Take half of your religion from her, there are 127 verses went missing from one single Surah, Surah al-Azab 33. Zuri reports, we have heard that many Quran passages were revealed but that those who had memorized them fell in the Yemama fighting. Those passages had not been written down, and following the deaths of those who knew them, were no longer known, nor had Abu Bakr, nor Umar, nor Uthman as yet collected the texts of the Quran, John Burden, The Collection of the Quran, pages 126 to 127, Abu Bakr Abdullah Abi Dawood. Kitab al-Masahif, edited by A. Jeffrey, Cairo, 1936, page 23. Abu Musa al-Ashar said we used to recite a surah which resembled in length and severity to Surat Bara'at, Surah al Taubanine. I have, forgotten it with the exception of this which I remember out of it, if there were two valleys full of riches, for the son of Adam, he would long for a third valley, and nothing would fill the stomach of the son of Adam but dust. Sahih Muslim, Volume 2, Hadith Number 501. This revered companion said in plain language not only some verses went missing but entire surah disappeared which equals in length and severity Surah al taubanine Surah al taubanine has 129 verses. By severity must probably he means the many corporeal punishments prescribed for the transgressors and infidels. Surah al tawbah has the verse of the sword which permits Muslims to kill anyone refuses to believe in Islam, Surah al tawbah 9, 5. It also includes Surah al tawbah 9, 29, which orders Muslims to kill Jews and Christians if they refuse to embrace Islam or pay the jizya in gold. Abu Harbabu al-Aswad reported, We used to recite a surah which resembled in length and severity to Surat Barat. I have forgotten it with the exception of this which I remember out of it, if there were two valleys full of riches for the son of Adam, he would long for a third valley, and nothing would fill the stomach of the son of Adam but dust. And we used to so recite a sora which resembled one of the soras of Musabi Hat, and I have forgotten it, but remember this much out of it, O oh people who believe, why do you say that which you do not practice and that is recorded in your necks as a witness against you and you would be asked about it on the day of resurrection? Sahih Muslim, Hadith number 2286. This revered companion confirms the assertion of the previous one and adds that there was another surah disappeared from the Quran too. Aisha reported that it had been revealed in the Quran that ten clear suckling make the marriage unlawful, then it was abrogated and substituted by five suckling and Allah's apostle died and it was before that time found in the Quran and recited by the Muslims, Sahih Muslim, Book 8. Hadith number 3421
This hadith of Aisha has recently created huge moral and religious scandals that shocked the entire Muslim community. Based on this hadith, a prominent Egyptian religious professor at the prestigious Al-Azhar Al-Sharif University issued a fatwa permitting Muslim women to breastfeed their male colleagues at work and classmates at universities so that they can become illegal for them to lust after them, marry them, or have sex with them. Religiously speaking, the professor is absolutely right, but the fatwa outraged the Muslim community because encourages Muslim girls to practice blowjobs or pornography with their classmates and colleagues. Imagine a young girl opens her dress and shows her breasts to her colleague or classmate and then allows him to suck her nipples ten times. The professor was fired and his fatwa was considered immoral and illegal. Although, the professor was fired still no religious scholar or professor could prove him wrong. This is a huge topic and we will revisit it in a subsequent chapter and find out what made Prophet Muhammad to come up with such an immoral teaching. Aisha reports, the verse of stoning and of suckling an adult ten times were revealed, and they were written on a paper and kept under my bed. When the Messenger of Allah expired and we were preoccupied with his death, a goat entered and ate away the paper, Musnad Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Some verses of the Quran vanished because a hungry goat ate them up. No comment. An Obey ibn Kab said that there were two surahs which he used to recite as part of the Quran, al kant and al wajr in them were these words, O Lord, we ask Thee for help and pardon and guidance, and we believe in Thee and put our trust in Thee, and so on to the end of al wajr This he said in respect of the first compilation, no longer extant, the Apology of al kindi Sir William Muir, London, 1881, page 76. Al Kindi continues to say, then followed the business of Al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, who gathered together every single copy he could lay hold of, and caused to be omitted from the text a great many passages. Amongst these, they say, were verses revealed concerning the house Omeya with the names of certain, and concerning the house of Abbas also with names. Six copies of the text thus revised were distributed to Egypt, Syria, Medina, Mecca, Kufa, and Basora. After that, he called in and destroyed all the preceding copies, even as Othman had done before him, the Apology of Al-Kindi, page 77. The third and most powerful stronghold is the belief that Muhammad is greater than any previous prophets of God and after him there is no prophet will come. In this regard, he is considered the seal and final of all the prophets and messengers of Allah. Anyone claims to be a prophet after Muhammad is to be considered a liar and false prophet and hence to be put to death. To Muslims, Muhammad is an ideal of spiritual, moral, and intellectual perfection. This belief might prove irrefutable sometimes because of the upbringing of the Muslims. In Islam, every sin is pardonable except the sin of insulting Muhammad or doubting his claim to prophethood. Apostasy in Islam is considered treason. The apostate is viewed as a traitor who has forsaken his country and joined with the enemies of Islam. For that reason, the Prophet Muhammad prescribed capital punishment for apostasy. Nonetheless, an apostate still can be forgiven if he repents and returns to Islam within three days. If a Muslim sins against the Prophet Muhammad by doubting his claim to be a prophet or insulting him, there is simply no appeal. According to all schools of Sharia, Sunni and Shiite, such an apostate's sin is unpardonable and must be killed even if he is found holding to the coverings of the Holy Kaaba in Mecca. So, the Muslim can think of any thought or doubt anything about his faith with the exception of going against his prophet. The Muslim mind is fashioned in such a way that it cannot doubt the validity of his prophet. That is why I always say, Islam is Muhammad and Muhammad is Islam. It is almost impossible to convince the Muslim that his prophet Muhammad committed a single sin in his life. He can be persuaded to believe his Allah committed sin but never his prophet Muhammad. Not a single Muslim in the entire world can pronounce the name of Muhammad without adding the phrase Salah Allah Alayhi Wasallam, which means, Allah pray to him and greet him. Muhammad is supposed to pray to Allah or Allah pray to him.
Muslims had intentionally translated that disgraceful phrase as peace be upon him in order to hide the blasphemy. Saying the name of Prophet Muhammad without adding that phrase might cause the Muslim to lose his life. One of the imperatives of becoming a Muslim is to believe that the Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God and he is sinless and infallible man. It is well established doctrine in Islam that Muhammad is sinless and perfect human being. In order to make a Muslim doubt the virtues of Muhammad or to see how evil and sinful he was, the Muslim's mind requires outside assistance. While not every Muslim is a terrorist, every faithful follower of the religion is a potential terrorist. The terrorists are those who sincerely follow and practice the teachings of Muhammad. In other words, those who practice the teachings of the Quran and Sunnah of Muhammad become Muslim terrorists and those who practice partially or not practice at all are the moderate Muslims, known as hypocrites by the true and sincere Muslims, the terrorists. Sometimes, they count them as infidels and kill them. Therefore, fighting Islamic terrorist groups is fighting Islam itself. The only problem, in the long run such tactic would prove to be a self-defeating. The more you kill the terrorists the more they multiply and increase. Islam is a religious ideology and hence only through exposing its danger and fallacy it can be refuted and banned. Every Muslim man believes and practices the teachings of Muhammad about women is potentially able to abuse his daughters, sisters and wives. If you extrapolate this fact, he can be abusive to your daughters, wives, and sisters. This fact leaves us with no choice except to liberate Muslims from their erroneous and treacherous beliefs. Muslims can be liberated through exposure to the truth and confrontation about the wrongs that their Prophet did and their Quran teaches them to do. Honest and direct writings and speeches help Muslims open their eyes. The current religious dialogues are nothing except flattery and courteous conversations between the few intellectual elites from both sides, Christian and Muslim, and the masses never get benefits out of them. Sometimes, the religious debates are just hair-splitting arguments or hypocritical talks. Every Muslim man and Muslim woman is a victim of his own beliefs and it would be a crime on the conscience of the civilized non-Muslim world to leave such a person living in such tyrannical beliefs. If only the international community awakens from its delusion that Islam is like any other religion except for the fact that certain splinter groups malign them, self-deception of this sort would vanish. We simply owe it to ourselves to recognize Islam for what it is, an emerging militant global terror. Islam is not and will never be a compatible religion. In the past, the world called for the emancipation of black people from slavery system that was previously believed to be justified religiously, ethically, theoretically, evolutionally, and ontologically. Today everyone agrees that slavery is evil and a crime against fellow human beings. Likewise, men have oppressed women for thousands of years, but today, women in many parts of the world are in every way, equal to men. Muslims have been victimized by the teachings of the Quran and Muhammad for over 14 centuries, but the time has come for the world to unite and confront the danger that it presents. So far, 50 countries joined together to fight against the dangerous Islamic terrorist groups such as ISIS and the like. Two quick observations, first of all that war is not directed against the real enemy, the teachings that are making them terrorists and increasing their number day after day. Instead of killing the infected people, first destroy what the agent of infection which would otherwise cause others to fall sick and reach a state beyond remedy. You should immunize Muslim children before they grow up and get infected. Islamic schools should be either secularized like public schools in the West or forbidden to teach jihad and hatred towards non-Muslims. The United Nations is supposed to review and scrutinize all schools and universities' curriculums in Muslim countries and purge them of all teachings that incite hatred towards the so-called infidels and enemies of Allah. Secondly, it is impossible to win a battle from the air. Air strikes create collateral damage. You need to put boots on the ground and hunt the aggressors down. I believe that military confrontations of terror are on an upward spiral from the Muslim world. Indiscriminate use of guns and weapons do not solve the problem of terrorism, it in fact gives rise to potential terrorists. 
Direct and honest speeches and writings from the international community might help Muslims see the deception and the danger of their own beliefs. Some people might think that Muslims are under curse and hence they will never listen to anyone. I believe that everyone who is not in Christ is under curse and dead in his sins and trespasses, Galatians 3, 13, Ephesians 2, 1. The Bible never tells us that there are some people more cursed than others. In this regard, all people are under curse, Jews and Gentiles, and unless the Lord opens their eyes they will continue to be what they are, see Romans 5, 12-21. It is true that no matter how much the Muslim is enlightened and westernized, his religious beliefs will continue to hold him captive and hostage. No Muslim would nor will ever agree with Western values and principles. Wherever he goes and despite whatever education he receives, he would still consider his Prophet Muhammad to be his role model. He is required to practice everything his Prophet commands him to do. For example, in one of his authentic hadiths, the Prophet Muhammad said, If one of you sees something wrong, let him change it with his hand, if he cannot, then with his tongue, if he cannot, then with his heart, and this is the weakest faith, Sahih Muslim. This hadith encourages Muslims to take the law in their hands wherever they are and punish or kill anyone they see doing something munkar. Munkar means everything considered haram, forbidden or sin, according to the Sharia. This includes many legal social practices in the West such as being bikini-clad on a beach or swimming pool, drinking alcohol, unmarried couples cohabiting, nightclubs and discos, gays and lesbians, casino, etc. Many times, this hadith is the reason behind deaths of tourists on the beaches of Tunisia, Egypt, Dubai, etc. Today, Friday, June 26, 2015, while I write these accounts, three terrorist attacks took place on three continents, Africa, Asia and Europe, against foreigners because they were involved in doing munker or harem practices. The other two attacks took place in France and Kuwait. It is the first time that the Islamic terrorists have beheaded someone in France and openly displayed his decapitated head. The severed head had Arabic writing scrawled across it and was found on a fence next to two jihadi banners, Sky News. The writing was the Shi'ata Islamic Creed. Muslims also believe and are highly likely to follow a commandment of Muhammad which says, I have been commanded by God to kill everyone who refuses to believe that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the Messenger of God, Sahih Muslim. I know that most of the Muslims living in the West will not likely to put it quite so plainly. Many Muslims living in the Muslim world and of course, the so-called Islamic terrorists will say it openly and clearly as their Prophet did. Recently, a very prominent Muslim leader said on a Lebanese channel, called al Mayadeen, we were Arab Christians in Iraq, Syria, Palestine, Yemen, Egypt and North Africa and then Muslim Mujahideen came and converted us to Islam by the sword. Then, he proudly added, Al-Islam Quran Yadi and Sa'if Yagazi, Islam is a Quran guides to the truth and a sword invades and conquers. Following that maxim of evil, in short period Muslims reached until Spain. If it wasn't for Charles Martel who defeated them in France at the Battle of Tours, or Poitiers, they might have invaded the entire Europe and today all Europeans would be Muslims and speaking Arabic. Most of the historians rightly believed that Charles Martel saved Christianity and Western civilization by the decisive Battle of Tours, October 732 AD.